Thank you all for joining us. Um, and as I said, welcome to Wellness by the Water Cooler for our September edition. Uh, and before we get started, I'll just let everybody know that this session is being recorded and the recording will be sent out following the session uh, end of today, tomorrow morning. Um, so you can watch it from there as well. Uh, and so before we begin, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we're all joining from today. I am on Gadigal land um, with the people of the Eora Nation. And I also want to acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. So today for our Wellness by the Water Cooler webinar, I am really excited for this one. We have Pippa Rose from Aspect Psychology Group, uh, who has a wealth of knowledge and experience. So Pippa has worked in workplace health safety and well-being for 21 years and has a detailed understanding of the theory and practical application of effective workplace programs that promote positive well-being, uh, positive health, prevent ill health and support those who have a mental or physical health condition at both the individual, team and organisational level. Pippa has worked in leadership roles for leading health, mental health uh, not-for-profits, including Beyond Blue and Super Friend specialising in workplace psychological health, safety and well-being. These roles involved uh, co-design strategy and resource development, research, advocacy and stakeholder engagement, together with delivering highly valued best practice solutions and consulting assignments with measurable impact. Prior to this, Pippa was the National Manager of a Specialised Business Unit of Workplace Health and Safety and Injury Management Experts at Connect working with businesses to address issues and implement solutions on all aspects of injury management and risk management across the employee life cycle. Welcome, Pippa. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, lovely to, to be here. I should say uh, Pippa is, uh, we have had a few technical difficulties in the lead up to this, so we're just taking a breath to be in the room, in the virtual room or together, because sometimes those technical issues can feel incredibly stressful when it's 11, uh, 10 59 and you've got an 11 a.m. <laughs> webinar that you want to do a really quality job of. So <laughs> thank you for being with me today, uh, Pippa, and for your patience and, you know, for making sure that we, we got there in the end one way or another. Yeah, no worries, but thanks for um, inviting me. So today's topic is all about workplace incivility. And so although this is not a new concept per se, for me, it is a term of phrase that I have only recently come across. Um, and I just love that we've got this opportunity to focus in on it and explore it a bit more. Um, but I'll stop gushing about how excited I am by the topic. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to throw straight to Pippa to tell us a little bit about what we mean when we say workplace incivility. Yeah, sure. So um, I think it, it can take many forms in the workplace. I think basically it's a, a form of disrespecting others within the organisation. So sometimes it can be, you know, really blatant and, and bold, you know, things like hurtful feedback or undermining someone. Um, and then other times it can be a little bit more subtle. So, um, you know, eye rolling, um, not paying attention in a meeting or looking at your phone, not acknowledging a person's presence. Um, and, yeah, it's those, those small behaviours um, that can really, you know, cumulatively have a big impact on people and really, you know, I guess make people feel disrespected within their workplace and for what they're contributing. It's really interesting because I think, you know, we talk about, we think about workplace conflict or bullying or, you know, really toxic cultures that um, are quite, I guess, overt in how they present. However, when I hear incivility, sometimes, as you say, that might be a little bit more obvious, but then other times it can be subtle. Um, and also what I was reflecting on when thinking about this topic is, you know, oftentimes a person might not even realise that they are creating that or contributing to that culture or that environment of incivility. They might just have had a stressful morning with getting the kids out the door or technical issues or something. And so when they show up to a meeting, they might be looking at their phone and distracted or they might not say hello. And this might happen, you know, if this happens frequently, you know, it might cause that issue. So I think it's really interesting how um, the, the, the sort of 
impact or the possible impact, but also versus the intention. Sometimes it's it's quite misaligned. Whereas something like bullying, there's usually a clearer intention to make someone, you know, to dis- uh, not include someone or make someone not feel good. Whereas incivility might be, uh, yeah, not as intentional. Um, so I'm interested in your experience and what are some of the causes or contributing factors that really create that culture of incivility? You gave some examples of, you know, that not saying hello, but is there anything else you can tell us about from that regard? Yeah, so in terms of um, causes and contributing factors, um, you know, I think usually we sort of see incivility, um, or in, our, in my experience anyway, it can often be a symptom or, or a byproduct of other issues that might be present in a workplace. Um, and so I think if you sort of broadly put them into kind of three categories, um, the first one can be, you know, around the organisational culture and some of the system factors that we see in a workplace. So, you know, an element of um, just deeply embedded behaviours and, you know, it's just the way that we've always been. Um, and that can be evident in some industries um, as well, particularly when there's um, high pressure environments. Um, sometimes it can be related to the way in which performance is measured and rewarded. So, um, you know, workplaces that protect the, you know, the high value or the indispensable workers that seem to be unaccountable for um, unacceptable behaviour. You might be familiar with the term the brilliant jerk. Um, you know, the person that meets all the outcomes and, you know, sales targets, but um, is not, you know, measured on the way that they align with values and, and behaviours. Um, sometimes it can be just a lack of structure and clarity around um, policies and processes and, um, you know, or a lack of trust in the way that um, behaviours are reported, a lack of safety in actually raising these things. Um, poor leadership, you know, not role modelling if leaders are behaving in a certain way. Um, obviously, that sort of sets the tone. Um, and I think another key thing that we see quite commonly, particularly of late, um, so when we see incivility identified as an issue in a workplace, you know, through a psychosocial risk audit or other data sources, and then we work with teams to try and unpack, you know, what are the contributing factors the things that we commonly see um, that can contribute to incivility are things like, you know, high work demands and unmanageable workloads, um, you know, role conflict, um, job insecurity, um, you know, not having enough support from colleagues and, and leaders and also through organisational change. So I think we can all reflect when those, those other risk factors or, or, you know, stressful situations going on, um, we're probably not performing at our best or not, you know, relating to people. We might become, as you mentioned, even if it's, you know, minor things that could happen on the way to work. If this is constantly occurring in the workplace um, and it's not picked up early, um, you know, then we've got to get those sort of reactive, um, perhaps blunt, short, discourteous um, type of responses. Uh, and another thing can be just, you know, lack of training and communication skills, conflict resolution, um, you know, those cultures that everyone's got to, um, you know, they don't have the ability or the confidence to have those courageous conversations, um, you know, can also contribute to incivility. So, yeah, sort of see those three areas, such as the cultural system, the psychosocial risk, and then probably that capability communication piece as being the, Three main areas. It's a lot, isn't it? I think yeah. um, <laughs> something that I'm reflecting on as you speak is how how there's you know all these psychosocial factors, you know, change and like you said, workload, demand, you know, conflict um, of roles, or um, I think you mentioned about yeah, lack of structure. Um, but there, and then you've got this symptom of incivility and, and it's about understanding what that is and noticing what that is and having the skills and ability, you know, to actually navigate that. And we'll get to that shortly because I think that's probably what a lot of people are curious about if we've all probably worked in an environment where there's incivility um, or there's somebody who's just or a few people or lots of people who, you know, are, are sort of displaying some of those behaviours. But as a as an individual as a manager, as a senior leader, what do you do? But um, we will get to that in a moment. So 
when you and I were talking about this this subject uh, a little while ago, Pippa, we talked about how incivility is the gateway drug to bullying and conflict. So what can be done if a leader notices or feels this incivility kind of bubbling away, given that sometimes it can be more subtle, but it has such a uh, sort of uh, um, potential to be so uh, impactful and so negative? Yeah, so I think we'll get on probably a bit later to more of the preventative strategy. Yeah. Kind of thinking about it um, in the moment and if the behaviour is ignited by a leader. I mean, I think like most things in a workplace and outside of the workplace, you know, early addressing of the factors and in an informal manner is, I think, is, is the best approach. So, you know, a, a discussion just to raise the concern or the observation um, to, I guess, bring the attention of it to the person. It could, as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, there might be lots of layers that might be underneath that behaviour. So rather than going straight to, you know, a, a formal approach, um, you know, really having a, an open conversation, say, look, this is what I've observed. I'm not sure if you're aware um, you know, this is the, the impact that it has. Um, obviously, if you're in a workplace that has really clear understandings and expected behaviours, that can be helpful because you can then tie it back to how that particular observation is not meeting or is not aligned to those expected behaviours. But, you know, obviously in that first instance, I think taking more of an informal approach is um, going to have more likely sort of success. And like, um, you know, other issues in the workplace, obviously, if things are repeated, um, then, you know, escalating and going down formal approaches from there. Um, I mean, it can be quite challenging, I know, from an employee to an employee perspective. Um, mm. You know, I think if a person feels comfortable and safe to be able to say, look, I, you know, I, know I felt quite disrespected when you weren't, um, you know, when you ignored me in the meeting or when you weren't, um, you know, paying attention when I was presenting. Um, obviously, that would be ideal, but then understanding that, um, you know, employee perspectives and, and experiences might change. So, um, you know, going by a leader or a manager, if that's the case, to um, be able to have that informal conversation. Mm. Um, I've got a few questions uh, percolating in my mind, um, just in terms of, you know, when you did talk about uh, the sort of possibility of going down a more formal route, you know, if you have the informal kind of conversation at first, um, I guess I'm curious about how, in your experience or your thoughts on um, if the informal approach, you know, doesn't seem to land. So uh, thinking about it from a manager to employee point of view, if a manager has a conversation um, with somebody in their team or with their entire team to say, I've noticed this, it's having this kind of impact. If that continues to not change and, it, and the impact continues to be more significant, but it's still at that sort of incivility, more subtle behaviours kind of level. So um, is that something that people can, like is taking a more formal approach appropriate when it's, when it's sort of things like eye roll or not saying good morning? I'm just curious about how to navigate when mm. it is quite nuanced still, uh, but you have had those informal conversations. Is formalising it appropriate? Yeah, look, I mean... I, again, would probably shift to more of a focus on, you know, obviously having that informal discussion, but then looking at, okay, how can we create a culture of civility and respect? So it might be that working as a team to come together, um, you know, if you've got a couple of incidences that have been noted, those individual informal discussions haven't been as effective as you'd hoped, um, then really, you know, saying, okay, well, as a team, how do we want to, um, you know, respect and align our values and behaviours with, you know, what is meaningful to us as a team? So I'd be looking at um, taking more of a, a positive approach in the first instance and, you know, getting buy-in from the team members so that mm. those um, behaviours are agreed um, and that people feel like they've contributed to it. So I think if you can, you know, if everyone has a, a chance to, contribute and say look you know this is how this makes me feel I like you know attending meetings on time it's um you know just general courtesy and respect in a in a workplace environment um I would suggest that that you know is is um, probably the best way to go um mm. 
taking formal approaches, if that is repeated, it's like any, you know, that we know that this causes harm. It is a recognised psychosocial risk. So, you know, we still um, need to be addressing that seriously um, because it does have a big impact on people's uh, psychological health and, and wellbeing. Yeah, that's really that's really great, I guess, advice in terms of setting those expectations, having everybody contribute to those expectations, breaking it down by behaviours because just talking about respect at work can mean different things to different people. You know, some people don't care if someone says good morning to them and other people really do care and, and are mm-hmm. affected by that. So bringing that to a safe sort of conversation and a team charter sort of agreement is is a great idea and a great way to kind of then set the, the standard and, and start to hold people to account using a more sort of formalised document and agreement um, if that doesn't already exist. And yeah. as someone else I've just noticed in the chat did say that workplaces right now should also be assessing and reviewing and implementing controls around psychosocial hazards and incivility is one of those. So it is a must-do. You know, we do need to be creating workplace cultures that are positive and supportive and not toxic. I guess it's the it's the turning that into a practical application when it's subtle and nuanced is is a you know it's one thing to say we should be it's another thing to say well how and I think this is where yeah. it's really helpful. Definitely, um, I think that's the the you know that first question was really around I guess that you know one on one approach within a team, but you know certainly in terms you know like all psychosocial risk, it does need to be looked at in a in a system approach and rather than, you know, a, a Band-Aid solution just as an issue arises, it's really important to take a step back um, and, you know, do a proper analysis and assessment on what are the factors that are contributing to, you know, the incivility as well as, no doubt, a lot of other factors that are going on so that you're really taking a uh, yeah, systems approach and intervening, um, you know, multi-level across the organisation actually making lasting impact. That's one of the things whenever we uh, connect, Pippa, I really appreciate and value and recognise the uh, sort of um, lens that you take, that aspect group take on that systems approach because, yes, nothing is sort of happening in isolation. It is a system in a workplace. That's very true. Um, So we talked a little bit about sort of what incivility can look like, some strategies for how to how to address that. Do you have any advice on how incivility can be prevented and how a culture of respect can be cultivated? Because as you have alluded to as well, a strength based uh, sort of preventative approach is what we should all be striving for. Yeah, so I think. you know, as in terms of the intervention or, or the way in which you want to target uh, with an organisation, it really does need to be led by a particular organisation and what their needs are. So, um, yeah, before jumping into sort of um, an intervention, whether it's looking at preventative approaches as well as managing existing situations that are present, um, yeah, undertaking that, that analysis, um, not just quantitative, but also really... Um, listening to your team members and staff members and going through that um, thorough um, consultation process to get underneath the the hood or the the lid of what's going on. Um, And then I guess your intervention um, really is is guided by that. And so things that, um, you know, we've seen that can be, um, you know, individual approaches looking at, you know, coaching and support for leaders. It can be looking at hiring practices to say, look, are we um, adequately hiring and recruiting people for their alignment with our values and and behaviours? It can be sort of team interventions um, around creating those group norms, um, looking at your reward and recognition processes, um, ensuring really clear accountability uh, when when people are not... um, you know, behaving in a way that's in line with the values and obviously having the robust systems around that. So, you know, ways to report, um, being really clear and explicit on what expectations are, providing people with the capability so that they understand how to have, you know, tough conversations, give feedback, um, you know, thinking about the way, you know, any um, bias that that might have when they're interacting with people. Um, so there's a range of different things that um, I think really will depend on 
yeah, what those underlying issues, which are going to be a little bit different um, depending on the organisation's needs and, and what their, their problems are. That's true. Yes, the interventions are going to be very dependent on the individual organisation. And um, I think some of the things you touched on in terms of accountability, reward and recognition, you know, having those conversations um, is really, really important. Um, and so, sorry, I did skip ahead to talk about prevention when we were still on the intervention stage. Uh, sorry about that. So now going into that uh, sort of next part, because as I, as I mentioned, prevention is key here, if we can. It's not always possible. It's what we, it's the aspiration, isn't it? It's something that we should all be aspiring to. So can you tell us a little bit about how we can cultivate a culture of, of respect and support um, to avoid this incivility from occurring? Yeah, sure. So, um, again, it, it does take, I guess, a comprehensive approach, but, um, you know, everyone has a role to play. It's not just, um, you know, one person's role, but leadership, commitment and, you know, actively being involved in this process is absolutely crucial um, in terms of creating that culture of respect and um, preventing those things from occurring. Um, so, you know, that can be, um, you know, I think once you're stopping even those small behaviours and really setting the tone at that leadership level, being really clear um, on what is expected and role modelling that, holding people accountable is going to be the key way to do it. Um, you know, I think having places where, again, behaviour um, that is in line with that value is rewarded, recognised, not tolerating um, those things someone is a brilliant kind of performer in terms of sales output, for example. Um, so it's really leadership, you know, showing with words, actions and resources the importance that they place on respect and how employees treat each other. So I think it really does come from that um, that leadership place. Mm. I think you mentioned earlier about that, you know, embedding those values and behaviours and expectations into everything that, that occurs within the business right from the beginning, you know, when you're recruiting and onboarding and KPI setting, you know, these are the behaviours we expect and these are the ones we will not tolerate. Um, so, yeah, that's how you sort of get it from the beginning, I suppose. Um, and supporting, I think, um, you know, it can be, you know, if that's not been part of how you've operated previously, to have, um, you know, individuals, um, you know, actively calling out the behaviour as well. Obviously, that needs to be role modelled by leaders, but yeah. you know, when you're supporting your colleagues and, um, you know, also performing, um, you know, pointing out those things as well individually, that can make a big difference. Just while we're on that topic, one of the questions I have also seen come in just to um, go a bit out of order, which I like to do, is around how would you deal with incivility if it was your manager, um, you know, it was contributing to it or sort of the the, the cause of it, um, and it's condoned by leadership. I mean, I read that and I think you get a new job is my first, <laughs> is my first sort of gut reaction, but that's obviously not possible necessarily. I'm being a bit flippant. So do you have any tips or, or advice on how to navigate if leadership is contributing or leading that problem? Yeah, and, and that can be, uh, you know, a real issue that people are facing and really, you know, challenging to navigate. Um, you know, I think as we talked about um, that seeing incivility as a psychosocial risk mm -hmm. and reporting it by your health and safety reporting mechanism, if that is yeah. something that you've tried to, you know, raise through informal measures, perhaps you've um, spoken to people in culture or another colleague or how to manage you perhaps have tried to communicate that to your own manager and it hasn't been effective, you know, going down those more formal reports um, routes and seeing it as a risk, which we know it is, mm. um, than something that you just need to tolerate. Um, I acknowledge that, yeah, it is difficult when there's yeah. layers of leadership perhaps above you that are not supportive and you don't have those structures and systems in place. So. Um, I, I don't have a, a magic solution for that, yeah. unfortunately, but um, I would say, you know, trying to have those clear, um, candid conversations about the impact of that behaviour on you as an individual. If you, again, I know that there are variable safety levels in um, depending on your situation, 
um, but then utilising, you know, formal reporting metrics. I mean, some people, some organisations have, um, you know, confidential reporting um, lines if that is seen as appropriate or you're yeah, going through sort of work health and safety routes um, might um, be effective there. Yeah, it's a really tough one, isn't it? I mean, I think, that, you know, when I reflect on that question about leadership, if they're part of it or condoning it, I think condoning it, yeah, it's if, if they're behaviours that perhaps they're, they're unaware of. So I think if it's those more nuanced, subtle behaviours because that manager is also under a lot of pressure, still not okay, but if they're experiencing going through that change in the workplace or increased work demand and, you know, a lack of uh, role clarity as well, you know, they might they might suddenly start coming in and not saying good morning or, you know, having less patience and, you know, micromanaging more, or, you know, all this incivility starts to play out. If yeah. there is a level of safety there, having that conversation up front can be effective, just saying, look, when, sometimes when you do this, it has this effect on me. Now, that's assuming there is safety there, there's rapport there, which can only be built from, you know, that preventative side of things when you're having one-on-ones with people. Mm. Uh, you know, you're building that relationship and that connectedness with people in your team so that then if that sort of, you know, incivility creeps up, those conversations can occur before it turns into something more problematic. Uh, but, yes, there's, a, there's like a lot of psychosocial sort of risk management and hazard mitigation it is systems, it is complex, it's not just do this and it will solve it. It's, you know, some of these things take time and sometimes, you know, it might not be something you can fix straight away and it is a matter of, you know, getting outside help, figuring out what, you know, your next steps might be um, is the reality. Mm. And I think, you know, we do, you know, leaders and managers, um, I mean, I know there's a range of the situation that that person who asked the question might be quite different to what I'm referring to, but... You know, obviously we want leaders and managers to be role modelling and setting the tone, but, you know, they are human. Um, it's role modelling is not about being absolutely flawless. It's kind of authentically trying to do better. So I think we've probably all, um, if we've had manager roles, reflected on situations where we thought, or someone has given us feedback and we've reflected, my gee, that probably wasn't the best way I could have worded that. So owning up to that, being open to feedback, mm you know, trying to do things differently, I think is really important too. Um, it's, you know, like we've all yielded our kids and then apologised or, you know, yeah. it's, it's about sort of being honest and open and willing to to improve. I think yeah. if, um, you know, a team member was felt safe to come to you and said, look, the way you spoke to me or the way you did something made me feel like this. Mm. Um, you know, I'd hope in some organisations that that would be um, taken on board and responded to in a open way. That's right. Yeah, well said. Okay, so that's, I mean, we have talked about this already a little bit. This was my last sort of official question for you on this subject. So, uh, and like I said, we've touched on it a bit already. So I imagine people on this call might be thinking or wondering how leadership creates a culture of instability and if there are any employee behaviours that can help prevent it or manage it. So that is essentially what we've been talking about. But I guess, is there any way, what's the role that we all play in, in this? Is there anything further around that? Yeah, so I think we have, you know, talked about that leadership, setting the tone, role modelling the behaviours, being open to feedback. Um, I think having multiple levels or opportunities for communication and feedback, and this is not a just you know, being super nice to each other. It's about having communication where people can be clear, um, open, honest about challenging things or if, um, you know, you might disagree with a certain thing but doing so in a respectful manner. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of individuals and organisations struggle with that sometimes. Um, so having multiple communication pathways and feedback um, loops, I think, is important. Um, you know, there can be capability building. So, again, um, equipping people in um, different communication techniques, conflict resolution, um, positive workplace behaviours. Um, obviously, this topic links into a lot of diversity and inclusion type um, areas as well. So ensuring that, you know, your approach is very consistent and aligned um, across the board in terms of the way that you're dealing with um, the, the behaviours of the organisation. 
um, you know, it can be around looking at helping people become, uh, you know, active bystanders and um, contributing and, and speaking up. Um, I think recognising and rewarding civility, um, you know, publicly acknowledging mm. or privately uh, acknowledging that that is more appropriate um, around respectful behaviour. Uh, and mm. I think it really goes a long way um, in setting that tone. Um, and, you know, I think individually, I think we've all got to take a bit of a look at ourselves sometimes as well. Like I could certainly, if I'm honest, um, think about several times where I probably haven't been, um, you know, a best version of myself and perhaps have, um, mm. you know, made, made someone feel disrespected. So I think having a look at your own behaviour, being accountable, um, mm. yeah, and taking feedback um, is, is really important as well. So I think it's that, that dual approach, obviously, really starting with, um, with leadership and ensuring that that scaffolding and that systems approach um, is in place to support those behaviours. That's right. I have a lot of thoughts swirling around. As you know, we've talked about this before and I'm sort of pinging around with various questions. I'm going to go through the chat in a moment, I guess. I just wanted to sort of mention quickly that I think for some of these, and again, incivility is a bit of a spectrum. You know, there is um, incivility of like blatant rudeness um, uh, and then there's sort of incivility of the not saying good morning and the sort of more subtle ones that are, are might seem more difficult and sometimes you don't even know why it is that there's this sort of walking on eggshells feeling you think that person's not a terrible person but I do feel really awkward around it I guess there are um, and we have touched on this a little bit about how we all have different expectations and um, interpretations of respect and how that sort of presents in the workplace there can be people who might be neurodivergent who really might struggle to say good morning you know or people who are just not morning people who just can't really engage in a conversation till they've had their coffee. And so I think it is about self-awareness. It's about having those mechanisms in, in place to say that to each other as a team. You know, look, if I don't say good morning to you this week, it's because I've got school holidays and my kids are home. So getting out the door is even more difficult than, than usual. Or, you know, I'm, go, I'm moving house, so I'm really stressed at the moment. So just give me a bit of a wide berth. And if I seem a bit funny, that's why. So like you said, yeah, having those building that safety to have those conversations, having well-being check-ins as a team so you know where people are at and if their behaviour starts to kind of tweak and change a little bit, you might know why. Um, and, yeah, leading with curiosity and, and compassion and being open-minded to each other. Again, I'm talking about those more subtle, you know, behaviours that are about open to interpretation. Of course, yeah, incivility when there's blatant rudeness is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just have a look through our chat. We've got a few minutes to look through that. And we've got a few questions that have come in, which is great. Uh, I touched on Anna's question around, um, well, comment really around how workplaces should be implementing controls around psychosocial safety. And this very much is one. Uh, then we have got, um, sorry, we've got deploying the whole policies and procedures that respond to bullying seems too much for repeated eye it's almost as if workplaces should have a separate response plan for instability. And I think, yeah, that's a question or a comment from, from Barbara. Um, and I think that is that is true, absolutely. I think doing a full formal investigation, and again, it sort of depends on the, the specific behaviours that we're noticing and to what extent they've been going on. And I think you've touched on that really well, Pippa, around taking an informal approach but then putting in place maybe those team charters and conversations as opposed to targeting someone for um, bullying and harassment. Uh, I'm just reading these out to see if there's anything. Um, and the other thing that was mentioned as well by Barbara was around we have to be sure that we aren't completely discouraging conflict at work and conflict is not necessarily bullying or incivility. And I really like that comment. I was talking recently to someone around conflict being healthy debate, um, or even sometimes it can, you know, push over into not so healthy, but it's about how you repair and come back from it, which you've also touched on. Did you have any other sort of reflections around uh, how conflict has got a place in the workplace? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that was one of the um, I things we mentioned around, uh, you know, providing people with the mechanisms to have those discussions around you know, disagreeing with an approach or um, questioning, clearing, because we know that, um, you know, having those psychologically safe 
uh, respectful discussions is so beneficial, um, not only for the individual, but also for the organisation in terms of, you know, innovation and yeah. performance. So it's certainly when we talk about, I guess, preventing incivility, it's not about having a, an artificial <laughs> culture yes. where we ever, you know, say we don't disagree with people. Everything's fine and dandy all the time, yeah. Yeah, that can be quite damaging um, also. So, yeah, one of the, the things was to perhaps, you know, look at lifting the, the capability and confidence that the people who have those really, you know, um, kind but candid um, discussions and feeling okay to raise um, issues if, if you don't agree or you have um, a not approach. Absolutely. Uh, I've got quite a few questions coming in, which is fantastic. We'll see. We'll see if we can get through a few more. Um, sorry, having a quick read. I can't see them to be able to. No, that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to throw them to you. Um, someone has mentioned uh, sarcasm, which is interesting. So, um, can sarcasm be seen as incivility? If someone says, I'm sarcastic, that's my sense of humour. How can that be navigated? It's quite a specific question, but I wonder if that's something you've uh, come up with your clients that you work with, sort of navigating those, again, those differences in what you think is appropriate and what someone else uh, might disagree with. Yeah, and I think as well it's it's about having, again, both informal conversations if there is an approach that someone takes that you do find disrespectful Um or makes you feel uncomfortable to be able to say, look, I, you know, understand that that's something that that comes naturally to you or the way in which you communicate, but that does make me feel like this um, to to bring it to someone's attention because it could be that they're, you know, being using that kind of um, approach with lots of people that's never come up. But you know, I think just raising it and, and being aware is is really um, pretty yeah. important. And if a person is not open to feedback of the impact of their sarcastic sense of humour and, you know, how that's, you know, affecting you, I think that's a different conversation again. I think a lot of this comes down to self-awareness, open conversations, all those sort of principles, as you've said, Pippa. Yeah. I've got another, I'm probably going to do one more question. We have more. And what I can do is in our follow-up email, which will have the recording, um, I can answer, or Pippa and I can answer some of these questions as well, just do a bit of a list. So, We'll just do this last one, um, which was around what is your view of how important behaviour should be in performance assessment? So usually, typically, we look at um, KPIs and look at performance as outputs and, and those metrics. So what's your view on how behaviour should be should be and, yeah, should be assessed? I mean, I think it, it definitely should be an element of, you know, everyone's um, way in which their, their performance and um, their you know, how they're measured. So there should obviously there's some, you know, tangible things that um, organisations do that um, using other data sets, whether it is, um, you know, census information or 360 feedback or other outputs that would tend to imply that the culture or the behaviour of a particular leader or team um, is not as functional. Um, I, I think that really sets um, a, a tone and really supports that that culture um, of respect when you've got that that expectation and people know that. Yeah, I think I like to think that we are moving towards a world where those behaviours are more embedded in in performance assessment. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, not for every workplace, but I think that's where we're heading to. Um, look, I'm going to do one more because we do have a couple of minutes. Uh, Kylie has mentioned, um, she just said, I would love to hear directly about civility's relationship to connectedness as the number one protective factor for thriving workplaces. So connectedness is one of our super friends, five, five domains, and we know the impact of a lack of connection can have on mental health and well-being and employee engagement. Um, what do you think of that sort of relationship between connectedness uh, and which can flow into isolation and how incivility kind of sits in relationship to that. Any reflections on that? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, if we feel um, a sense of, of connection and, you know, belonging within a workplace um, and we get to know people beyond, you know, just their, what they might output in, in work, I think that really helps foster respect um, and civility. Um, I, I think those two are very much linked um, and obviously 
by, you know, rather than just trying to prevent incivility, I think the aim should be trying to foster that connected, respectful workplace. And I think if that was in place, um, you know, a lot of these things probably wouldn't happen. So I do think it's um, really important. And, and you still can, you know, be connected and have that respectful workplace, even if you're not, I know that we've got lots of virtual environments, there's still lots of ways that um, we can still foster that rather than having to be in the same room. But yeah, I think those two things are really Certainly connected. You're connected, yeah. Thank you, Pippa. No, so good. we're going to wrap up now. Eleven forty-four. Wonderful um, timekeeping <laughs> by me. Um, pictures at the beginning. We made it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so thank you so much, Pippa. That really is incredible information. I think there's a lot more that we could unpack. There's more questions that, like I said, we'll we'll touch on. Um, there's a lot of nuance here. It's hard stuff, you know. I think we're all trying to grapple with it and talking it through in one webinar is probably just the, the sort of um, the top of the tip of the iceberg. So there's a lot more that could be said and explored. We'll be sending out a, a follow-up EDM uh, with the links to different resources. Someone's asked about resources as well as the recording for this. Um, my colleague, I think, should be putting the um, link to our survey in this chat now, plus that will be going out in the email as well. We'd love to hear from you. We really want to know what else you want to know about if we're touch, you know, if we're touching on topics that are relevant for you, we want to keep making this content really relevant for you. So, um, thank you again, Pippa. Uh, we'll be in touch soon, and thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.